Hey everyone, welcome to our November Science Speaker Series. Again, I'm Jeanelle Gurley, Director of Science and Programs, and it is my absolute honor to welcome Richard Ward. For those of you who are just joining us, thank you so much for taking time out of your schedule to spend an hour with us this evening to learn more from Rich, rather, to learn more about. Don't click that link. Rich's presentation this evening suggests that the internet has brought amazing services to your living room and phone, from streaming music and movies to online commerce and banking. At the same time, this brave new world has created an environment rich with bad actors, scams, attacks, breaches, data spills, and much more. There are a lot of threats out there, but being aware of which ones are real, which ones are myth, which ones are likely, and which are rare will help you navigate the internet much more safely. So this evening, Rich will discuss some of the common threats and work his way up to some very sophisticated attacks that have become part of the threat landscape. Richard Ward is a technical fellow at Microsoft, and he leads the enterprise and security team for the Microsoft Windows and Devices Group. There, he oversees the engineering teams responsible for the security of the Windows platforms, as well as the connection to the commercial customers and their requirements. Previously, Rich ran the storage and networking team for Windows, as well as the Windows phone team, running the developer platform team and the Windows mobile labs team, which focus on incubation and prototyping of new technologies in the mobile space. Ward joined the, mobiles, rather, the Windows mobile team after a long stay in Windows, where he headed the core architecture team. In that role, he focused on broad design issues, such as state separation and management for both Windows components, as well as applications. Ward also ran the security development team for Windows NT 3.5 and NT 4.0, as well as the core security group for Windows 2000. During this time, Ward wrote the first SSL and Kerberos implementations for Microsoft and oversaw the evolution of the original NTLM authentication protocol. Ward joined Microsoft in 1989 as the security developer for the LAN Manager product line. It is without further ado that I welcome Rich. Very well accomplished. <laughs> <laughs> uh, all right. Th thank you, Janelle. Uh, I, I don't often read my own bio, so it was an interesting <laughs> trip down memory lane. Uh, so uh, thank you for inviting me in on this series. Uh, and I will look forward to uh, trying to get across as many of the things I aspire to, uh, realizing that we only have an hour or so to do this. And uh, as I was putting together uh, this presentation, I realized that uh, some of this, I kind of cover some basic software engineering, and then to explain that, I need to cover some other things. So hopefully we'll get a good enough message across. And... We'll see if the dog finds anything in the background or what, what happens next. Oh, we're excited for the journey. <laughs> <laughs> All right. The floor so, is yours. <laughs> uh, uh, title here, let's see, actually, are the slides coming through okay? I, I confess, uh, since yes, I am are. Microsoft, that uh, Zoom is a little bit of a mystery to me, but <laughs> we're going to give it a good shot here. Um, and uh, hopefully this will all uh, land well. All right. And there we go. Okay. I'm probably getting a mouse on that too. All right. So what's ahead? I want to talk about what makes a vulnerability, why so your software, your programs, your apps run into trouble. Who are some of the bad guys out there? What's the worst that could happen to you? Uh, what does that mean for us? Or is all civilization going to collapse? Uh, all, all these things that could go horribly wrong. Uh, I will try to cover all this if you do discover that I'm being unclear. Don't hesitate to to uh, raise your hand or contact, uh, Janelle will bring in uh, questions as we uh, progress. And we should have a little segment at the end for uh, open question and answer as well. Uh, OK, so uh, we will be talking about uh, like who are the bad guys out there? What makes for a soft, uh, software vulnerability? Why, does, why do applications fail? Uh, I said we had uh, some background as I was putting in this presentation together. We had a lot of, uh, or I had a lot of like, oh, I need to talk about that. Oh, I need some background to talk about that. So we're going to go kind of deep into the background uh, and land out with some things that are going wrong in the world and how to be aware of them. But also, uh, I want to say that what we're not doing today is we're not going to be uh, doing any physical demonstrations because uh, 
physical demonstrations of computer security vulnerabilities are really boring if you're not in the industry. Uh, and even if you are in the industry, they're kind of boring. Uh, so we're gonna be, this will be mostly a slide deck. I apologize, I don't, I watched some of the other uh, science series speakers and I unfortunately will not have any tanks of water, buoyancy, bicycles, anything like that. We're gonna go straight with a uh, deck. So to get going, I thought we needed to get through some background definitions. So some definitions that we need to uh, kind of get on, under our belts so we can have a better conversation. So a common term of art here is a vulnerability. And a vulnerability is an exploitable weakness in a system. It's, it's a gap. It's something that's going wrong on... Uh... All right, we're gonna go with that. All right, <laughs> third try is the charm. So vulnerability is an exploitable weakness in a system. It's a gap, it's it's the missing fence line, it's uh, the door left open. Uh, it, be, it can show up in any system. It's not unique computer systems in any way, but it it is just that, it's the whole. It's nothing more than that. An exploit is the difference. An exploit is, as uh, we call it, a tactic, a technique, or a procedure to take advantage of such a vulnerability to force the system to behave differently. So uh, if the window is left open, the exploit is crawling through the window. If the, core, the car door is unlocked, the exploit is to pop open the door and see what's inside. These are We want to call these out differently because there are lots of vulnerabilities that are extremely difficult or even unexploitable. Uh, and then there are lots of things that one, once one exploit is developed, lots of other things can come along. So again, in the physical world, if you discover that the uh, car door is open, you can also probably get into the trunk or into the hatchback and things like that. So those are different exploits, but they are all taking advantage of the same vulnerability. A mitigation lessens or eliminates the vulnerability. So a mitigation could be, in our case, a, a lock on the door, uh, you could close the door and latch it, uh, the missing fence line you could put in the fence. Mitigation can offset the vulnerability, but doesn't necessarily have to solve all of it. Uh, risk in this context is evaluation of the cost to mitigate a vulnerability against the value of what's being protected. So uh, if you have, for example, a car that could be easily totally stolen, putting the uh, old uh, steering wheel lock on, it could be a good cost-effective mitigation to losing your whole car. That's a, a good trade-off. Uh, putting your car inside of a bank vault, never using it is too high of a cost. It's not really a good plan. And the threat is the bad actor or something else with malicious intent that is looking to exploit your vulnerability to gain access to what is protected. So in our physical world, we're also often talking about uh, our you know, the, the proverbial thief or someone else who's trying to break in. Uh, but threats actually come in lots of different ways. Uh, so you know, a, a threat could be certainly someone trying to steal something. It could be someone trying to get in and take pictures. It could be someone who is just trying to get in or get out, uh, like uh, a threat in certain circumstances could be someone uh, like uh, a dog. If you have a dog trying to get out of a, of a place, all these things can be threats in the context of what you're trying to, uh, to evaluate and protect against. So vulnerability, so not specific to the cyber world. Uh, this is plenty of things going on in the real world that can be modeled in, with this language and in fact, uh, most of these uh, terms of art came from physical security and trying to map it to what we have available to us here. So where does that leave us? So let's go through a quick example to kind of show all these different things. Here is probably a picture that many people have seen in some way. Uh, the kid at the top of the stairs. Don't want the kid to go bumbling down. Our threat Toddler escaping the safe zone, falling down the staircase. The vulnerability is there's no protection at the top of the staircase that prevents that from happening. That kid can go up and down to his heart's content. One possible mitigation is a nice robust gate. Steel frame, concrete posts, be fantastic. That, that kid would never get through that gate. Cost is very high. 
benefit is comparatively low for actually installing a gate like that inside your house. Not, not a reasonable, not a reasonable uh, solution or, or outcome. Solution, baby gate, cost effective, keeps the, two, keeps the kid from going over the edge, cost appropriate, mitigates the risk, everybody's happy, generally speaking. I will point out is a mitigation. A mitigation does not completely solve the, the threat or it does not eliminate the vulnerability. Mitigation lessens it to a, what you consider manageable. For example, you could have put the larger gate in, you could wall off the staircase, but then it wouldn't be as useful anymore. But the trade-off, of course, is they're going to go over anyway. At some point, some the risk balance, the risk and reward trade-off will apply to someone and they'll say, yeah, it's worth me scrambling up over this gate down, crashing around until we get through. And uh, you know, toddlers may have a low sense of uh, uh, risk assessment and they may do this. Other mitigations uh, in the real world are actually usually quite effective and helpful. So where does this take us? Well, as I said, you know, kind of had to kind of dig back to get a, uh, to explain kind of what's going on in the software world. Software engineering is actually very different than mechanical engineering. And so if you, in our previous examples, I was talking about, oh, you know, the car window could be open or there's a hole in the fence or the window is broken or things like that. Uh, software engineering is very different than mechanical because the uh, connectivity is, or the, uh, the, space that you see is it all virtual. It's all tiny uh, electrons that you can't directly observe that way. So subtle errors can also have extremely large effects. Uh, a very simple error can expose an enormous amount of data because of the way the software all hangs together. So let me dive into an example that will help uh, kind of enumerate some of this. So. Heartbleed is the name of a vulnerability in the SSL or TLS implementation used by a huge number of websites. So SSL and its successor TLS are the protocol that you that are used by your browser when you're talking to a website. When you say HTTPS, that's, this is the protocol that gets used. Uh, there was a subtle bug that allowed the client to interrogate the server by using a legitimate request that was not implemented correctly. You think, okay, that's, you know, implementation error shouldn't be that that traumatic. What, what's really going on here? Uh, clients are, or uh, these kinds of interactions are kind of complicated to begin with, and they're hard sometimes to implement correctly. And even when they're implemented correctly, it's not always obvious, or well, they're implemented correctly enough that they can escape further detection. And Heartbleed is a good example. As an aside, uh, the, this industry loves coming up with dramatic sounding names for these kinds of uh, vulnerabilities and bugs. So Heartbleed was a, was a good headline grabbing uh, code name. So this is uh, what I'm gonna show here is a, uh, what we call a swim lane diagram, uh, which will be obvious in a minute. And what this is doing is it's going to try and show you the exchange that's happening between the client uh, in this case, it would be uh, your browser or your phone or wherever you have to be in the server, which is the web server on the other side. And in all these things we have is the client makes a request to the server and then the server responds in some fashion. So in the normal case here, your browser is doing something like, hey, send me baby, dot, you know, baby photo, baby dot JPEG. And the server, thinks to itself and grinds around and then says, got it, I found it. Hey, here it is, here's baby.jpg. And that get, lets you see whatever content you're getting. And this has turned into an enormous uh, source of uh, interchange across the, inter the network where all your clients can talk to the servers and, and lots of things happen. Uh, this kind of exchange can go on for a while. So you can say, hey, send me baby.jpg. Sure, here's baby. Oh, now send me the puppy one. Okay. And then the server is quite happy to send back, yep, here's the, the puppy picture. This could, this goes on billions and billions and billions of transactions every day. So uh, for example, on that on your favorite web page, if you're looking at, for example, the 
New York Times, every article, every picture, every headline uh, at least is going to be one of these kind of transactions. And uh, there's lots of other things going on there too, right? Because you know, all you know, all those ads are showing up and those are going off to get third party servers and all sorts of things are happening. But ultimately at, at the bottom of this, your your browser is, is talking to a server at, at, at any given moment and saying, give me that content that you have right there. So what happens in all of this is uh, often when you have uh, more complicated actions going on with the server. For example, maybe you're uploading a large video or you're about to download a large video or something like that. You might want to see how things are going and maybe the server will say, hey, I want you to go someplace else. But uh, a common ex exchange could be, hey, how the client could say, hey, how, how busy are you? How things are going? Can I make this? And the implication is, can I make this next request? Can I ask you to do something else that's going to take a while? Um, and there's a there's a trade-off here between you know how much information do you want to disclose about the state of your server versus you know how happy do you want to make your clients and so forth. And this is a fairly simple kind of uh, flow control as we say way where the server might say, yeah, I'm doing fine. I'm about ten percent busy. It's fine. You can make a big request or whatever. And then the client would say could say later, hey, are you still there? And this is a very common in protocols. Um, as I used to say, the, the problem with the word network is it includes the phrase work. Uh, it Certainly in the early days, and honestly, even now, you'd be amazed how many packets get dropped, uh, how many messages kind of go floating off into the ether on the internet. So sometimes it makes complete sense for the client to say, hey, are you there? Because maybe something has happened. Did someone unplug your Wi-Fi router? Did someone take a backhoe through a fiber cluster outside of uh, a big... Uh, interchange point, whoever, lots of reasons that the, you thought you had a connection that may have gone away. So it's not unreasonable for the client to say, hey, are you still there? And then the server can say, yeah, absolutely. Go, I've got 10% um, busy, send whatever you want. I'm happy to do wh whatever we've agreed to do in, uh, in this particular exchange. Heartbleed had this interesting exposure where the uh, client could do had a, a more advanced echo kind of capability. So rather than just saying, hey, are you there? And the server saying, yeah, I'm there. Uh, the protocol, the TLS protocol, uh, TLS 1.1, I think, had this interesting uh, special thing where I could say, hey, if you're there, reply with echo. By the way, echo is four characters. And then the server says to itself, huh, clients want, clients, wants these four characters, E-C-H-O, got it. And whoop, that's great. Sure, here they are, echo. Boop, boop, boop. And then, you know, so you could do this in, the, in this context and say, great, now that I know that you're there, send me that whole movie file. And then down comes a two gigabyte movie and everybody is happy that you were uh, using up the bandwidth and getting a, just what you want. So here's where it all goes awry. Heartbleed had this bug where instead of just the server saying, how many characters did you send me? The client gets to say what it's doing and, it's, and it can say something different than what it's actually doing. So the problem arose when the client says, hey, if you're there, reply with echo. And, and that's 1,024 characters, trust me. And Maybe you can see what might be going on here. The server says, ah, the client wants these, uh, wants 1,024 characters starting right here where it says EHCO. And it says, sure, here's echo and 1,020 more characters be, that are next to the section. And this works because the way the data is stored is lots of things get held together. So uh, in our request here, hopefully this is easily visible on your thing, we have the client request saying echo is there, but then there are lots of other characters after that that could contain very important data, like, oh, the client named John Doe has social security number 9999, blah, 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 and the balance in their checking account is whatever. 
because this could be the response to some other client making a request. This could be something else going on. And this is what, what just happened. Data for lots and lots of server or lots and lots of clients are mingled together. And there's you know, memory is expensive, and there's all sorts of reasons for how this works physically. But fundamentally, the program needs to keep track of everything in order not to get confused. And when you have lots and lots of data, they're going to have lots of lots of what we call fragmentation and pooling, where data for different requests may end up kind of uh, Kind of geographically next to each other, even though they're part of different requests. And as long as everything is going what, well, as long as everything is being accounted for correctly, it's no problem. The server knows that you know this this record over on the left is going to be 65 characters, and this next record is going to be over here, and it's going to be 72 characters, and it's all very straightforward. The problem is when something comes in like Heartbleed and says, "Start here, give you a thousand characters." Boom! You can get to see lots of things that you shouldn't have been able to see. This is one of those examples where the error can be really subtle. Everything is working fine. No, no, in this particular example, nothing faulted, nothing, nothing broke. You're, you, know, you didn't get the application error. You didn't get a blue screen of death or anything like that because the server just said, oh yeah, you wanted a thousand characters? I got a thousand characters right here. Here you go. Uh, so, and well-written clients were already saying, I'm sending you four characters. Give me four characters back. They were so... Well-behaving clients didn't trigger anything bad, and badly behaving clients didn't trigger anything bad. So suddenly there's this situation where there are lots of information being, uh, lots of information being leaked out, and no one could, no one knew about it, and no one could track it easily. So these, are, this is really hard uh, to diagnose because nothing blew up, and my example. And in this, these kinds of situations, as should always be in these things, is a card analogy. So these things are very hard to diagnose. There are no physical artifacts. Here's, here is a picture of, according to the internet, a Nissan engine block. And as you can see, it's in good working order. Everything looks fine here. And if you over rev it or you don't oil the, you don't have the right level of oil or any other set of possibilities, you can throw a rod. And you can see very clearly where the rod came out of the engine. Uh, there's a big hole, uh, even to the layperson. And I am using a car analogy. I need to confess that I am not a car person in any real sense. So uh, I can tell you as a car layperson here, I can see where the problem is. The thing that is supposed to be inside the engine has now exited the engine and the engine is no longer functioning as it once was. This is very easy to, to spot. Uh, I'm not saying I could repair it, uh, but I could say, oh, wow, that, that, that's not a good sign. Everything has gone downhill from there. So what happened for the Heartbleed bug is here is the server rack before. And then as people were exercising that bug, here's what the server rack look, looked like afterwards. There is no change. There is no physical change to any of this. Uh, it's not to say that there aren't software bugs that affect physical things. Uh, that is a huge, that has always been a problem. Uh, it's, we, we have caused problems on that front. And as an industry, uh, there are lots of areas where things can go wrong. Uh, a, a minor one, maybe not in Nantucket, but uh, elsewhere, occasionally the traffic signal lights uh, kind of get jammed up. Uh, that's something affecting the, the uh, the real world, and of course, there are negative things too. There's a, a classic case where someone did not understand uh, that there are places in the world where the altitude could be below sea level, and there is a plane that was going through some uh, test runs uh, over uh, Death Valley, which got can get below uh, sea level, and the plane flipped upside down unexpectedly because something went negative when. No one was expecting it. So these are serious problems in certain scenarios as general bugs, but in general, there are no, there's no physical outline or there's no physical characteristic that you can see that says, wow, my machine has just been hacked. And that that is why this is a very complicated and subtle problem to diagnose. So how are all these vulnerabilities exploited? Uh, so a number of things have come together 
over the last 20 years that have really changed how this all works. For starters, in the physical world, distance matters. I am sitting in uh, Northeast Seattle right now, and uh, if I wanted to break into the uh, whatever, Four Vestal Street, uh, first of all, I'd have to fly there. It's a long ways, and it's not, it would take a long time. It's not a direct access. It costs me a lot of money to get there. Uh, everything uh, in the physical world is expensive. The interconnected, the interconnected nature of computers means everything is local. And I'm using local in a very uh, loose sense, obviously. And if there are other software people on this call, you will all be saying, what about latency? What about ping times? Uh, but for on a practical human scale, uh, I can send a connection request around the world in about 400 milliseconds. Uh, I can go just about anywhere. And uh, even on the on a really laggy satellite link, I can get a, a connection within five or six seconds anywhere in the world. So uh, that aspect of understand of uh, the, the distance has gone away. So anyone can come and rattle your doorknob in a virtual sense. Uh, everyone can come and can, everyone in the world effectively can come and knock on your your door, on your website, on you know, your uh, email exchange point, all sorts of things uh, with virtually no cost, which is why you see a, a huge uptick in uh, how these attacks are coming around. Humans, like us, uh, are pretty good at understanding physical distance. I have, I know how far away it is to Nantucket. I'm not going to randomly decide to go knock the door at, at Four Vessel Street. Uh, humans are pretty wired to understand threats that based on distance. We know uh, that's why when you're walking through the woods and you hear a rustle, uh, you know, the, some part of your brain in the back is going, whoa, that's a tiger in the bushes. Um, and even if it's just the wind, that's okay. You can have the, the quick response and even if it wasn't a tiger, no, no, great, no great energy loss or problems with that. You can go on about your business. Humans are terrible at understanding long distance threats uh, and they're not as good at these networks. So understanding that it's not just the, uh, you know, someone in your neighborhood who might be looking at your door cam uh, and seeing who's coming to see, but it's actually a group of uh, hackers in North Korea who are saying, oh, we're gonna see what we can find on you know, this, this network endpoint or that network endpoint. People have a very poor understanding in general of that kind of level of interconnectedness where, again, literally every machine right now, not quite, and we, you know, there are air gap networks and things like that, but the vast majority of computing devices are connected to each other in some way right now. It's, it's a, uh, a monumental number. <laughs> so let's take another example, since I like relating these to the physical. Um, this is a tumbler lock. Uh, I think most everyone has a tumbler lock of some variety on your door. Uh, your door is, you probably have like a Schlage lock or something like that, quick set. Um, you have a key, you go, you, maybe it's set to auto lock as you leave. So it just, you shut the door and it locks behind you. If not, it's a deadbolt. Perhaps you put the key in, you turn the key, you walk away and you think, yeah, I got reasonable security. And for a lot of things, it is absolutely reasonable security. It is more effort, for example, to pick the lock than it is to break the window in your house and, and go that way. So, uh, you know, the tumbler locks are, they provide reasonable security. Most of, I don't know how many people realize though, that most tumbler locks uh, can be picked fairly easily. Yeah, so, uh, there are a number of techniques. There are uh, bumps, uh, you know, bump lock, uh, uh, bump keys, even just normal uh, picking. You could someone who's skilled in the art could probably pick it in you know thirty seconds or less. Uh, that's kind of jarring if you think about it. You're like, oh my gosh, anyone could wander into my house, but I can't do it remotely. So this particular risk and this hack do doesn't scale. This uh, the exploit of for example, the bump key, which is sliding in a special blank and banging the lock slightly, 
it doesn't work remotely. I have to be in front of the house. I would have to go to Four Vessel Street to pull this off. It's not like I can do it remotely. All these things have to be in person. So yeah, actually, you know, it's a reasonable security uh, measure to take to have a tumbler lock on your house to make sure that you don't get uh, broken into. Or at least if someone's going to break into it, they have to expend a lot of energy to, and make it very visible. So put it all together. Uh, software engineering is very different than in engineering in the physical world. Uh, flaws in software are not easily seen. They don't leave easy traces. Uh, we've had, you know, depending on how you want to measure, 25 to 50 years of working on making more secure, reliable systems. Uh, and I can tell you, <laughs> some some problems have existed for the entire period of time. Some are new. Some are things that weren't even weren't even conceived of uh, 20 years ago. It wasn't even something that uh, the people who are most worried about this even thought about. Uh, it's a rapidly changing world. We are uh, building new tools for software as we go all the time. Things are evolving more rapidly than they are in most other industries. And uh, it is difficult to keep up on both sides, both with new features that you or new capabilities and things that you want to do, as well as uh, the threats that those can bring about. Software flaws can be sometimes leveraged to do worse things. The uh, nature of computer systems in many ways allows for uh, more things to be shared than you might expect. Uh, so we trust our web servers, we trust our email servers to keep information separate, we trust them to do what, there's, what we've agreed for them to do and, and no more. Uh, but when there are flaws and the, the there are there are vulnerabilities that are then exploited. These flaws can be leveraged to do the worst things. They can, ex they can be used to explore the state of the uh, server or of the, you know someone else's email. Look at someone else's database. Look at that bank record. Things like that. Uh, and there's lots and lots of research and work going on to make sure that there's more separation and there are harder boundaries and things like that. Uh, it, it is a hard problem, and uh, there are a lot of reasons why. These problems still exist, and we're, they they get successfully better. There's a uh, you know a million attacks that probably aren't workable anymore, but there's still new ones that are coming. And the interconnected world that's out there allows people to connect to computers as if they were physically near, uh, but they can do it from anywhere in the world. And so uh, I couldn't find a good picture, unfortunately, but there was a incident back in 2015. Uh, 2015, where the Netherlands Intelligence Service uh, hijacked the webcam at the uh, basically the office building that the APT APT 29 hacker group used in St. Petersburg, and took you know basically got the hold of the video stream there and watched these hackers go in and out. And it's not a case that the uh, hackers are living in their basement, uh, you know, sitting in the dark. It's, it's a job. <laughs> and uh, this highlighted that, you know, it's difficult for anybody. It's not like the hackers had super duper security that blocked everything either. They had uh, one group, was one spy group, identify who's doing that because they could sit in Amsterdam and connect to a machine in St. Petersburg and break it and figure out what's going on. At the same time, those bad actors on the other side were exploiting flaws, other flaws. APD-29 is behind some other interesting attacks. Uh, and they have, they don't have to go anywhere. They're sitting in, in St. Petersburg and they are not, uh, they are paid quite well and they are uh, happy to go and attack uh, machines around the world. It's an interesting legal proposition. It just, it is illegal in Russia for someone to commit computer trespass on a computer in Russia, but it's not illegal for a Russian citizen to trespass on a computer outside of Russia. So there's there's no legal recourse. It's a very great place, very uh, safe place for a hacker to to uh, take advantage of this world. 
So when you put all these things together, there's a lot of uh, back and forth uh, between all the, all the parties involved. And so let's go through a tangible example of a really bad case. All right, so in March of 2017, Microsoft uh, released a patch for a vulnerability that was being exploited in, in the wild, as we like to say. So there was a flaw similar to, not the same as what we showed before with Hardly, but similar to that uh, that was being exploited. It was a old version of a, of a protocol that was, that was part of Windows. Uh, was we were alerted to it uh, by seeing uh, some attacks. We tracked it down, issued the fix, and two months later, a piece of ransomware called WannaCry launched, uh, taking advantage of that. So let's just talk about that for a moment. So we release a patch. We say or a fix. We say this. Is this is a critical issue? You guys need all your customers should apply this as soon as you can. Um, the bad guys also get to see that, and so they can look at the code that was there before, and they can look at the code that has been changed, and then they can do what we call reverse engineer to figure out what just happened, and then they can say, "Aha! I know what's going on. I can take advantage of this very bug right now, and I, I will use it to do something nefarious." So. WannaCry was ransomware. Ransomware is a term for some a malicious, some a bit of malware that goes and encrypts someone's data on their computer and locks it down and then charges you. And they say, you know, usually in Bitcoin, they want hundreds of dollars, thousands of dollars, some amount to free up your data. Wanna, WannaCry launches, uh, patch machines are not affected. Uh, so everybody who had picked up the patch in March was safe. Yay. Uh, turns out uh, not everyone is able to pick up on that that uh, quick of a cycle. So WannaCry had an interesting throttle in it. Uh, someone discovered uh, what this throttle was and, and put up a, a, basically put up a global block. So in eight hours, WannaCry infected about 300,000 machines before it was shut down. Uh, by this, uh, by a hero in the UK, uh, the bad guys, both the original bad guys who said who came up with WannaCry, released an update, and then other people said, "Oh, look at this thing going on," and they also copied WannaCry and released it in, with a different variation to attack other people. So it is updated and deployed again, starts uh, affecting another several hundreds of thousands of uh, devices here and there. It was somewhat indiscriminate uh, when it goes. The University, uh, sorry, the United Kingdom's National Health Service was severely impacted. Thousands of machines were incapacitated. Um, all told, uh, there, there were many hundreds of thousands, millions of machines affected by this over the next couple of months. Uh, Microsoft, we released patches for older versions of the operating system that were not under general support just because it was so bad and the people who were being affected were running old versions of like Windows XP. So we released patches for that. Uh, this whipped around the world uh, in, in, well, first of all, that, in that first eight hours, it, it showed up almost everywhere, although uh, a couple of the worst places were, like I said, the, the UK. And then the, the later generations also whipped around the world uh, because everything is connected. And as soon as something got a toehold, they affect the it's a it is a wormable uh, bit of malware. And as soon as it got a toehold on one machine in the network, for example, inside of a hospital in Scotland, then it would go and attack all the other machines in that hospital because it was it was there and it was running. So this was bad. Uh, WannaCry, the original version, uh, was eventually identified as coming from North Korea. They uh, denied it, but uh, the U.S. government, among others, has uh, assigned uh, responsibility to uh, certain North Korean uh, groups that are doing that. The variants became prevalent to a number of different ransomware gangs. Uh, they, they were, as I noted, where they were picked up, variations were made, uh, basically, yeah. 
all the all the bad actors could say is, oh look someone's done all the work all i need to do is change a couple things change it to use a different bitcoin wallet or endpoint and look i can make take advantage of this as well uh the national health service was severely impacted uh a number i saw online was about seventy thousand nodes were taken offline uh that affected people's medical care uh, a lot of it was uh in the back office so to speak so it, it's not like the MRI machine was going crazy, but the scheduling, the, the machine that did all the scheduling for the MRI, MRI machine was offline. The medical records were offline. Uh, the stock maintenance system was offline. So you couldn't, you weren't sure how long the, you know, the IV bags were good for and things like that. So there were a number of uh, operations uh, and other bits of medical care were postponed for a while. It was it was uh, a big disruptor, and uh, it was not, as far as we know, specifically targeting that. It just happened to land there and then it just uh, walloped them. So what just happened and all that? Um, initial investment in developing malware is, can be very high. Uh, new vulnerabilities, so. A vulnerability, as we said, was was a, uh, a a hole, a gap somewhere. Uh, they are they are of different value in different ways. So, at the highest value, at, at, at a price of twenty five, sorry, two point five million dollars, is what we call a, a no click or a zero click. And an example of that is uh, just. Recently, earlier this year, uh, iPhone, uh, Apple or iPhone iOS released an update for a image parser. Uh, so the code that looks at a picture coming through that was sent to you, or actually that you're looking at in any context, uh, is especially tricky to write what we call parsers. They're the things that go through a file and then try and do something useful with it. So the picture file that JPEG um jpeg kind of a sloppy format uh and it's been it's hard to get all the connect all the counts right when you're looking through that file and someone found a bug in it and how uh, ios handled that and that led to a situation where someone could send you through a text message a photo that would take over your phone it's pretty bad and it, that is worth a lot of money that is that's where you get that that uh, two point five million. Uh, at the other end of the spectrum is like, hey, look, here's an you know, if someone happens to be running Word two thousand and they open this old doc file, I found a way of doing it. Yeah, well, it's just not as valuable to anyone, so that, that doesn't get uh, as much coverage. Um, but all these things, all these vulnerabilities are on the market. If you're curious, you can go to a site called Zerodium and they will they walk you through how they buy, buy uh, vulnerabilities. Uh, they have different ranges, what they're willing to pay for it. And then uh, a more well-funded group can purchase that vulnerability and then creates the exploit and the original malware that can exploit that vulnerability. Uh, an example, uh, so much like that, uh, there's a company based in Israel called the NSO Group, which is known for getting onto phones, and uh, they have purchased. They have, they are known to have purchased a number of vulnerabilities. They are they are known to have developed some of them internally, and they are the ones who can uh, you know, sneak some code onto your phone and take it over. Uh, it's been seen on various. Uh, various phones out in the wild. Once malware is in the wild, it can be copied and modified by other organizations. So the WannaCry case is a great example. A well-funded, relatively well-funded group in North Korea created the original exploit. Uh, they are actually using someone else's vulnerability, uh, or sorry, they're using our vulnerability. Use, they modified someone else's exploit and they jumped on it when they saw our, our patch go out and said, oh yeah, this is, this is what we want to do. Uh, but as soon as that's out in the wild, other people can copy it and do it as well. And they do it for a whole bunch of other different reasons. Some of them are well, not, there are no real good reasons, really, except for a few uh, researchers and certainly the, the original software vendor company like Apple or Microsoft or Google, where 
we take it uh, we identify it and then we have to issue a patch and so once it's detected once we've seen these things in the wild the, the publisher issues updates as soon as feasible and gets them out to people and this is a complicated uh, calculus where uh, modern devices may be updated more frequently older devices are harder to update uh, I mean, legacy compatibility problems uh, fixing some of these vulnerabilities may cause other applications not to work correctly. They were inadvertently taking advantage of a hold, not really the hold, but something not being checked correctly. So it is a complicated process to actually issue the, the uh, fix. So what does that all mean for you? Uh, here we are, we have a few minutes left before the questions start, I hope. Uh, and so what, what, what are you doing there? Uh, generally speaking, uh, you are probably not going to be the primary target of high value malware. Uh, even for those of us who have inflated senses of self worth, I am unlikely to be targeted by uh, the, you know, uh, the North Koreans with uh, an exploit that they have picked up on the black market. Um, it is certainly possible to be hit on the, as a buy, you know, as a buy blow. Most malware, not all, but most, is repurposed from other authors. So. It, I, while I'm not going to be the primary target, it is entirely likely that I would be a side target of someone trying to leverage this further uh, afield. The most important thing that you can possibly do is to stay up to date on your updates to your devices and avoid products with no ongoing support. Uh, so I think most, I'm certain that everyone who is listening to this talk right now has a smartphone in some capacity and those should be set to automatically update. Uh, they get updates on a regular basis uh, from all the, from major vendors. So the Samsungs, the Googles, the Apples. Yes, uh, if you are in the if you are finding certain uh, limited run phones from uh, off market vendors, you are at risk. Uh, it's a different set of economics there. Uh, they generally don't have the updates. They don't have. They don't fund for the updates. They don't produce the updates. Uh, so you're once you buy your phone from, if you were to buy a phone from, uh, you know, certain local vendors in other parts of the world, uh, you may be stuck. So I would definitely recommend staying with major vendors who have support programs, and you should pick up the updates all the time. Uh, the WannaCry example uh, is especially painful, uh, not, not least which it was our code that did it or was exploited for this, but we upped it, we issued the patch. It, people who had accepted the patch were safe from all this. It was people like, just to pick on the National Health Services, where updating, they are on old software and updating the software is hugely expensive and rarely well budgeted for. So if you have a, if you have a company, uh, hopefully you have budgeted in your company to stay up to date. And it's not just, uh, there's rarely a direct cost for the update, at least in, for, for current products. It is understanding how to take the updates and time them so that they don't interfere with the rest of what's going on. All too often people are rationalize away that, oh, we can't possibly take the update this week because it's the end of the quarter and we need to run all the numbers and we can't afford any changes. Sure, yes, yet. Uh, if you put it off for two months because of that thing, then WannaCry comes around and smacks you down. M most malware is ineffective against up-to-date products and products with anti-malware tools. So most malware is ineffective against a, an up-to-date iPhone or Android. Most malware is ineffective against uh, Windows that is up to date, and although it will, it's better to have an anti malware program running on uh, more open platforms like Windows. And there are a wide variety to choose from, including stuff that's in the box. So uh, it's a personal choice, but it is very, very handy. That is the best thing that you can possibly do. And second to that, keeping your devices up to date critical. Avoid clicking on links in received mails and texts. So uh, as I noted, uh, the zero clicks are the most valuable. Like when someone shows up or has a finds a, a vulnerability in the, the JPEG parser 
and they send you a, a text with a photo in it and your phone is on, there's very little that we can do to prevent that upfront. However, uh, what's more frequently the case is a single click where someone sends you a link to a website and there's some combination of the web code and the pictures and whatnot on the website that causes you all to, or your device to get whacked. Suspicious links are not always obvious, but some of them are really obvious. And uh, I went to my junk mail folder and uh, was making this slide and I looked quickly and look, there's, there's one right now. Uh, and you can observe that there's a whole bunch of gobbledygook in front of uh, a, a page that's hosted by Google APIs that someone took over. Uh, you know, don't click on, generally speaking, don't click on links. If you're really curious about that thing that's come in from Macy's.com or something like that, go to Macy's.com. Just go to, you know, type that into the browser or have, have your own top level link there and you'll be happier for it. Uh, never, I mean, that, that is Macy's, that's comparatively low risk. Never click on something that's purporting to be from your bank. It's just not worth it. And banks don't really send out uh, deep links anymore. Some some do a little bit, but even those, if it's, you know, you can look carefully and make sure it's actually pointing to your bank, not some gobbledygook in front of there. Uh, you know, if it doesn't say Bank of America or whatever, don't click on it. So I can't stress this enough. Stay up to date. Don't click on weird things and you're generally going to be okay. Uh, and that, uh, that's where we are. So, uh, Janelle, do we have any questions lined up there? We do. Thank you so much, Rich. So I shouldn't groan at my phone when Apple constantly reminds me that I have a new iOS update. <laughs> no, no, you should not. In fact, you should be happy that they're, <laughs> they're updating it regularly. Uh, Yes, and you should be running, I think, 16.2.1 right now. Let's see, what is this? That back. being said, I will accept the update for 3 a.m. <laughs> <laughs> yes, set the update for a time when you're not using it. And for the vast majority of user, of ordinary consumers like us, uh, 3 a.m. is a great time to, to let it do the update. Amazing. Question from Eric. What tips do you have to recognize phishing versus legitimate emails? <laughs> uh so phishing or legitimate emails? Well, uh, generally speaking, uh, when people are, are, you know, the phishing emails are trying to get you to divulge some level of information that they are leading you to believe they need. Uh, I was going back and forth with our security group, in our corporate security group today. I got mail, which was, which was technically spam. It was just someone who sent mail saying, oh, click here to update all your info so we can update your contact record. And I'm like, ah. I, I sent it as a fish. I'm like, nah, it's really spam. This is just some crappy marketer. But in general, uh, the goal is, is you think about it, if someone calls you and says, hey, I'm calling from the police department. I need you to unlock your door. Would you do that? Or do you call the police department back and say, is someone trying to get it? You know, someone just, so when you get mail, sure, it can, it might be looking for additional information, maybe phishing you for stuff. Go, if they're presenting, if they're pretending to be someone else, go to that website. A lot easier. If you have an account at Bank of America or, you know, Visa or whatever, go there rather than uh, just trusting anything in the mail. Right. Sorry, I guess the, the, the <laughs> upshot there is I don't really trust links in mail, period. That's just the, the simplest thing to do. Just be discerning always, <laughs> is what I gather. I had a few questions before I move to Sarah's question. I know that she's just bursting at the seams to have her question answered. <laughs> what cyber threats concern you the most currently? What cyber threats concern me the most currently? Um, I said, so uh as in a uh, there are lots of different taxonomies for this so uh the thing that always keeps us up at night uh or we call zero days uh so you know, any kind of unknown attack brand new is by definition we don't know about it so 
If, will it be deployed in a way that we can't track? Is it going to, so uh, going back to that WannaCry example, the vulnerability that we had in our code was in there and had been in there for quite a while and was being exploited on by a very very subtle well by very well written malware it didn't crash it didn't blow up in some obvious way so people were taking advantage of it and it was under the radar so those are the on on that taxonomy those are the things i worry about on um, on that front uh on the other one is you know, the other taxonomy is uh there is an enormous amount of uh you know, we didn't even get into false inf you know, information campaigns. Uh, right now, uh, we are tracking. We we are nationally. Uh, we, there is a group, uh, part of the government, the Computer Information Security Agency, uh, which puts out daily bulletins and weekly bulletins, and the they have a lot of bulletins on current or new exploits. That's always good to keep track of. But there are a lot of bad actors in the world, and uh, there are well-funded groups in countries that are not friendly to us that are happy to take advantage of confusion and so discord by sending out lots of things. So same way, you know, don't click on links. It's uh, you know, choose your information sources carefully because they mm -hmm. are under uh, steady influence. I guess is the nicest way of saying it. Mm -hmm. So, I have a lot of things that keep me up at night, so. <laughs> <laughs> Which is fair. Things that I often think about as well. I've definitely almost had my Instagram fully hacked, but I, I moved a little bit quicker than my hacker and I was able to prevent the hack. And I think one of the things that always just take me aback is how are they able in phishing and in these scams to mimic the number or the address rather that for instance, Instagram would send you up notifications from. How exactly does that happen? Ah, well, okay. So there, there are a number of ways that return addresses are identified. Um, so phone numbers are super crappy. Uh, mm -hmm. So the, you can't really trust the number that shows up as the calling number when someone calls you. Mm -hmm. um, it, it, there's a long history of why, but basically, uh, it's a it's a very open network, and when things were deregulated, and phone numbers were allowed to migrate all over the place, suddenly, mm -hmm. everyone had to kind of say, "Oh, all right, well, unless I, you know, if, if you say you're it's this number, I got to believe you." That's how the hookup works. Um, so there are nefarious players who let you buy a return number, and therefore you can text from there, and mm -hmm. uh, they they exist for a while then they get shut down and they pop up somewhere else so it's, mm -hmm. it, it's it's never it's not going to be solved in any reasonable amount of time right. email uh there are lots of different places for the return address or how it appears to be and this gets more this, this gets complicated pretty quickly uh in email the from address is almost anything you want to put in there uh and this works this is both a feature and a bug. Uh, the feature is that lets CC send and groups that handle and MailChimp and things like that you know, send mail as the Mariah Mitchell organization or something like that, mm -hmm. uh, which is good. We like that uh, because you don't want to have to figure out your own. That's a great right. thing to outsource is managing your uh, mailing list. The downside is that other people can do that. And so there are accepted ways of accepted and verifiable ways for you for MailChimp or someone to say, I'm sending this on behalf of mm -hmm. the Ryan Mitchell organization. And then there's sketchy ones. And sketchiness, you can see where either it doesn't show up quite right, it'll say something, and then it'll say whatever, uh, Janelle at ryanmitchell.org. And then somewhere else in that from line, it'll look like, you know, Fred at gmail.com or whatever. Mm -hmm. uh, and in failing that, if you're bored, you can click on the details of the of the uh, message itself, and it will tell you in a whole host of headers whether it was actually from a, a true uh, sender or not. And the most 
times gmail hotmail outlook.com me.com all, uh, apple uh, all those folks are that they, they handle that for you at this stage there's mm -hmm. uh, a number of uh, uh, dkif and things like that that allow for verification that a mail handler was allowed to send for this but stuff still sneaks through through uh, some things so if it looks weird don't click on it did I mention that? Yes, you did. <laughs> but not enough, definitely. <laughs> what measures will most improve the accuracy of malware detection systems while minimizing false positives? <laughs> wow. Uh, there's someone who's asking a, a more targeted question. <laughs> uh, identification has gone... Uh, it, the identification process has changed over, over the years and started as a very simple kind of, I'm going to look for this sequence of instructions and that, and if it has a, that long of a signature, I know it's, it's bad. Um, that turns out it, it worked well back in the dark ages, but it doesn't scale as well now. And so there's a lot more uh, uh, human intervention in this than we would like at this stage. So mm -hmm. what, generally happens is there what we call a low fidelity signature when we're suspicious of something happening we put out called low fidelity signatures which catch more than you know they bring in a lot of data and then we have to find what the signal is in there and then we create what we call high quality or high def uh, signatures which are accurate to exactly the the bit of malware that we're targeting um it's still because these things are all human authored and they are people who are trying to be stealthy and sketchy and all those things. Uh, they're all very different. And so the, the, the signatures change. Uh, we are, by the time it gets to a, a, a full signature, it is pretty well targeted. Uh, we our, our numbers show that we were in actually you know, our false positive rate is pretty low, I think, across the board on the, on the industry. Uh, it's not zero. It's probably never mm -hmm. going to be zero because right. there's always going to be some weird... Some of the tricks and techniques that the malware authors use are legitimate optimizations or ways to do mm -hmm. things, to make things faster or better in some way. So uh, things, things can be bad. And honestly, uh, if you have uh, enough data, eventually you're going to find a signal... If, you, if you're looking over uh, a petabyte worth of data, eventually you're going to find a random sequence that matches something like a, a virus and or you know, some bit of malware, and it would, it would be flagged even though it's not actually in that state. So uh, it'll never be perfect, but it's uh, pretty accurate at this stage. Hmm. How would you, or would you say that AI technology enhances our risk or minimizes our risk for cybersecurity threats? In your opinion, um, so it's uh, so AI in this context is more of it, it's another tool, and mm -hmm. like all tools, it will make things better and worse at the same time. Mm -hmm. How it gets used, so uh, we're using uh, we, have, we have products, and we are using AI to analyze the the signals coming in from uh, activity at corporate network levels and things like that uh, with actually really good results right now because uh, having humans paw through that signal is expensive and they get mm -hmm. tired, they miss things, but AI doesn't really get tired and they kind of chug away, which, which is awesome. Mm -hmm. uh, the downside is that AI is going to be used to do other things and it's going to be to, certainly AI is going to start fooling people better and fooling people more and more times, you know, not better and better, but they'll be, it'll become uh, AI processes will start creating things that are harder for us to distinguish. It was great when you could say, oh, look, that thing has six fingers. I know it was fake, but now that is going right. away. Um, it will get better on that front. Uh, is it going to create worse malware? Possibly. Uh, are the bad guys going to use <laughs> AI to uh, probe and, and analyze more things? Definitely. Are we also using AI to, to probe and analyze our own stuff to be more reliable or robust? You betcha. So it's uh, you know, it's kind of like it's another screwdriver in the toolkit. We'll see how we it will go. It'll be used by all sides. 
That is very good to know. Gordon says, thanks for the tips on breaking into a house. How was Heartbleed found? <laughs> is there a better way to find these than waiting for ransomware? Uh, let's see. Uh, how was Heartbleed found? Uh, it was found kind of peripherally uh, when someone else, when they were someone was looking for other jumps and discovered that it was an act, an active exploit, and then there was a big scramble to to clean it up. Uh, so it was not. Like I said it was it was mostly silent. I think there were a couple of crashes, but it wasn't. No one really realized what was going on until uh, there was a, a proof, and then. No, there was a uh, worldwide freak out uh, when they're like, oh my gosh, where is this thing? We have to get this patched. And what was the second part of the question? I have to go back. <laughs> and is there a better way to find these than waiting for ransomware? Is there a better way to find? Well, um, yes. <laughs> they're, they're, <laughs> it, almost, well, I think by definition, uh, any way of finding it would be better than waiting for ransomware. That is definitely the most expensive and painful way. Uh, however, uh, it is it is very challenging uh, to to find all the possible vulnerabilities. That is an area of extensive research. Uh, if we had another hour or two, we could talk about uh, software engineering and uh, safe languages and things like that. Maybe we'll, we'll if we'll have a, a, a another session at some point. Um, is it, there's a lot of research uh, going on right now to figure out how we as software engineers can write better code that mm -hmm. doesn't have all these vulnerabilities and therefore not subject to these exploits. Um, I can tell you, for example, that uh, for Windows, a product I'm very familiar with, uh, the number of vulnerabilities in new code is dramatically lower than the vulnerabilities that we have not found yet in old code because mm -hmm. And we have new practices and we're doing things better, but finding all the places in, in old code uh, that we can change reliably without breaking lots of things is much harder. And so that, that is a longer term project to put it kindly. Great. L asked, and we somewhat touched on this already, what are the potential risks of AI and machine learning in the context of malware? Well, like we said, I think uh, there's certainly uh, malware will be used to uh, recall, uh, you know, for, for phishing, for uh, fooling humans in some fashion, whether it's spear phishing or things like that. Uh, especially as we see AI get used, chatbots and things like that be used for the support. You know, so when you connect to uh, some company and they say, oh, talk to our assistant here. As you get, they, those assist assistants get better, you get used to chatting with that. Mm -hmm. Are you going to notice when someone is, when it's a, the person who is chatting with you is actually a North Korean hacker squad dude who does not speak any English actually and is, uh, is letting all this stuff happen in the background and is busily phishing you for some kind of uh, critical information. Right. Uh, that's you know, definitely one aspect of it. Uh, I think there is the, uh, sorry, let me say this. Everybody is using AI right now to kind of attack uh, code and we call fuzzing it to see if you know we can find a vulnerability. Uh, we, I think bad guys are trying it, but they don't have the capabilities necessarily that we do for all the code that we have and we're doing it as fast as we can for our own stuff so i think on the, the front of ai probing and attacking applications and finding vulnerabilities i think that the publishers will probably have the upper hand on that overall but it that'll be a close race for a while <laughs> question from eric does the government actually catch and prosecute the exploiters who are paid um, so, uh, there are a few exploiters, uh, from the United States that have been caught. Uh, there've been some, uh, attackers, uh, from other countries. There's someone, uh, whose name I'm blanking on, who's after a long fight has been extradited from the UK to the U S for, to stand trial. Um, uh, there are various cases where assets have been seized, uh, that, where we can see stuff. And uh, there is a steady 
progress of uh, basically seizing domains. So the uh, U.S. Marshals, I think, actually weirdly have jurisdiction, uh, and they can seize marshals or customs. So one of those two can seize domain names uh, that are being used to fraudulently lure uh, U.S. U.S. citizens uh, cu customers and uh, take them down. So we, we, there are a number of takedowns like that. Uh, that doesn't necessarily get the original person, but at least it stops the the thing from happening. But as noted, uh, actually, one item that I, I, I guess I neglected to say during the talk as much was in the old days, in the early 2000s, uh, vulnerabilities and were, were rampant and exploits were happening, but the exploits were mostly for uh, for the lulls, as they would say, for bragging rights, mm -hmm. uh, or to deface something like, oh, ha ha, we, you know, we ruined your website, ha ha ha. Right. Um, that changed about, uh, I don't know, 2007, eight, that period, where mm -hmm. it really moved into the nation state actors. So uh, there are a number of groups, uh, Cozy Bear, uh, other bears in Russia, there is a number of groups in uh in mainland China, there's northern Korea, there is Iran, and those folks are doing it to further the goals of their nation state, whatever that happens to be. And then, like I said, the, the, the economics are such that they pay the long-term or the large cost, the heavy lift, and as soon as other people detect that bit of malware out there, it gets repurposed and used for the ransomware folks. And when there's nothing new like that, then the ransomware people uh, devolve to just doing a phishing attack. You know, click here, run this tool. Uh, or, you know, I, I know of a case that hit very close uh, where uh, a group in Russia was seeding out. Uh, so you know, basically uh, apps that pretended to give you Adobe uh, mm -hmm. uh, Photoshop keys. So they would... You know, people would click it, they would install, they would get Photoshop working, and at the same time they would install mm -hmm. a backdoor Trojan that would then, you know, the, the bad guys in Russia would then say, okay, where did we land? Is this an interesting place? Uh, and you know, it was it's low overhead. They just send out all these little fake key apps, and then they wait till they get activated, and they go and see where that thing is. And if it's you sitting at home, they're probably like, no, that's not so good. If it turns out to be a uh, you know, someone in a design shop that mm -hmm. is, you know, trying to get around something else, they ah, that's more interesting because that design shop is probably being contracted by some larger company and that larger company right. could be it. So, again, don't click on bad links. <laughs> <laughs> Can't stress it enough. Gordon asks, if sending out patches is a dangerous way to signal vulnerabilities, is there a safe way for updates? Ah, uh, Gordon, we have wrestled with this one for a while. Um, there, the the turnaround time uh, is has dropped dramatically. So ten years ago, turnaround time was on the order of months for people to reverse engineer the patch. Uh, and right. the the trade off is so perversely, the larger the patch, the harder it is to find out what. The specific exploitable thing was so uh, as a publisher the best thing we can do is bury the security issue in with a hundred other minor fixes and then that slows everyone down enough to get the the patch out and you know if if it takes three months for the patch to hit uh, p uh p90 or you know, 90 percent of the population uh if we can keep it obfuscated by bearing it in lots of things, then that's great. Uh, the problem, of course, is if you discover something that's under active attack and you just have to release a fix for that right away, then that also flags exactly what the fix is. And then other bad guys can look at it and say, oh, this is, this is you know, they just released this as an urgent fix. Oh my gosh, we're going to figure out what's going on. Um, so, no. <laughs> so far, we haven't found a... a truly uh, effective way of having a silent fix or you know encoding the fix some way that uh, 
uh, the bad guys can't also get it because of course bad guys are customers they have purchased a legitimate copy and yeah you know, we have to give them uh, you know the, the, the updates but they mm -hmm. get to examine everything that's going on so they are attempting to outsmart the smarts <laughs> <laughs> Leslie asks, is the App Store safe in your opinion? Do we as consumers need to be concerned about downloading apps? Uh, <clears throat> so the App Store, uh, the App Store by their stats uh, removes, a, it has about 600, 700,000 apps at any given point. And every year they take down somewhere between 90 and 110,000 apps. Uh, so the, and doesn't mean that the apps are necessarily malware. It means that the apps don't meet the the standards that the the app store imposes, and therefore are in violation and get removed. Um, to some degree, you know, you know safe is, is the app store safe is is too broad a, a question in some ways because uh, so the way that the the phone works is that. Uh, the app needs to declare that it needs certain access to the phone mm -hmm. for, to run. And you've probably experienced this when the app says, I need, I need your location information. And the phone intercedes and says, do you want to let, you know, I don't know, uh, maps have your location? You say, of course I want the map app to have my, my location. And it's quick, yes. Um, the, that set of what we call capabilities has changed over the years. Uh, some things have been aggregated, some things are too fine-grained, uh, apps generally re request much more than they want, and the problem is, of course, that you as a consumer has just downloaded this new app from the store, and it says, I want all these privileges or these capabilities, and the, but you just bought it, so of course you're going to give it access to whatever. So uh, the goal is to have the capabilities scoped enough that they can't cause too much, they can't damage anything else on your phone and that they can they can't be they can't worm their way in they they can always be removed cleanly mm -hmm. uh but if the app says type okay you know type in your credit card for you know to get additional content and you type in your credit card your card's going to get charged <laughs> right. nothing we can do about that um you gotta watch out for that uh but at least if you don't like it and you say uninstall it you are pretty much guaranteed that it's going to be a clean uninstall. It's not going to leave remnants around and things like that. And, uh, you know, it might have, you know, as always, like Instagram, for example, has, I got an alert saying Instagram has access to your photo library. Do you still want that? And I was like, do I? Right. No, because <laughs> no. Uh, it can go through and it might be, you know, gathering metadata. It might right. Say, oh, look, you were in Nantucket a month ago and now mm -hmm. you're in Seattle, we're going to change your ad preference on, on Facebook. And I'm like, I don't need them to do that. That's not right. anything I need. So uh, it, the App Store, is it's a good mechanism. It's not a foolproof mechanism. Right. Uh, the, and uh, But at least the, it's relatively well-managed. And uh, like I said, you know, they do take down apps for, for their own policy violations and you as the consumer can remove the app and be real, you know, assured that it has nothing to your device and, but any information that you've typed into it, you should assume is gone. So keep that in mind. Definitely an area for more discernment as well, in my opinion. <laughs> Trish says that this is off topic but she has a few a huge favor on behalf of hundreds of Windows users who edit photos. Oh my! Microsoft, yes, <laughs> Microsoft changed the photo editing app almost two years ago and eliminated the crucial clarity feature to sharpen photos. Many of us would prefer to be able to restore the original app, which worked just fine, or add the clarity function to the new app. Is there any way you can help, Trish? Um. Uh, so I confess, Trish, uh, I am not on that team or close to that team anymore. My, my understanding is that the, a bunch of the features were removed to a store version of the app. I don't know if it's actually uh, uh, for a, a, a for a price or it's a free download, but I think that th there was a general push to move some of that stuff to the store to have people download the things that they want 
and therefore we get some uh, some better information. So first thing I would say is to do the first thing to do is, is see if what you want is in the store version uh, or a store version from Microsoft uh, of the photo app and failing that, uh, well, I don't know. I, I don't know who you are, but you can probably figure out, uh, you, you could drop me a note or something and we'll, we'll sort it out. I'm happy to connect you both. <laughs> what would you say has been the most surprising event in your time in cybersecurity? <laughs> most surprising time? Uh, there have been, you know, a week without a surprise is actually <laughs> a win in the cybersecurity world. Uh, there's there's yeah. been a lot, a lot of things. Uh, and like I said, everything, it, everything changes and evolves over time. So the things that we were surprised by and, and I get to respond to in 2002 would barely raise an eyebrow now. Of course, if that's the case, that's what's going to happen. Um, I think one of the most impressive, the two things that have been uh, in, in industry-wide that have been most eye-opening first was uh, was called Stuxnet, which was uh, an attack which leapt into a, what we call air gap. Uh, so air gap is a little shorthand for saying that there, there's an air gap between the network cables. So there's mm -hmm. no connection. So no, no data flows, right? Uh, where uh, malware was put onto uh, USB flash drives and scattered in areas where people might pick them up and eventually put them into a machine that would be mm -hmm. close to, closer on the other side of the air gap to the target. Uh, and this is what uh, was used to destabilize the uh, centrifuges used by Iran for uh, uranium purification. And it was, I mean, it, it, it was a masterpiece in terms of number of zero day exploits they were using and how clean it was. It didn't really affect anyone who wasn't in this situation. So it was not quite found by chance, but it was, it, but it worked. It got in, it, it spanned what was thought, you know, the normal internet all the way over to a, an air gap network through a flash drive and an accomplished goal. Uh, everyone kind of stood up and took notice at, wow, that was you know truly multimodal kind of scary stuff. Uh, and the other one was an incident uh, three years ago, four years ago called Solar Winds, where uh, uh, Russian actors, uh, Cozy Bear, uh, got a hold of the software development tools for a company that did uh, patch management and other things for uh, other for people who had on-prem services and and some off-prem services and some cloud services, and uh, they were able to inject code into products that would then progress along this company's uh, product application building process, so that uh, it would be you know it would be signed. It would look like it came from whatever the company was. Okay, uh, and it would in fact contain code uh, from. APT 29 <laughs> doing terrible things mm -hmm. and that was also one of those moments where we'd all known a very there's an old paper uh, by Ken Thompson called Reflections on Trusting Trust uh, where you know can you trust your tools do the right thing and everyone said oh yeah this is a problem we should all be aware of it and this is when it was actually weaponized and everyone went oh, oh boy that's real we should we, we need to be on that so mm -hmm. uh, there you go that was in 15 years, those are the ones that still stand out to me as, as eye-popping. Yeah, well, definitely. Would you say that there are any current or emerging on future threats that we should be most concerned about outside of clicking on suspicious links? How can we <laughs> better safeguard ourselves? <laughs> uh, yeah, so the, the thing that's uh, happening most, most now, and uh, a couple slides ago, I was, oh, I, I controlled the slides. So let me go back there for a second. Um, oh, I, can I do this? Uh, oops, no. All right, well, I say avoid products with no ongoing support. Mm -hmm. uh, right now, there's a huge push, right? and there has been a huge push for the last 10 years or so, but 
uh, we call IoT or Internet of Things. And so that's your, your webcams, your smart doorbells, and your water meters and your thermostats and all this stuff. Uh, they're not hugely profitable uh, places right now. And so the companies come and go very mm -hmm. quickly. And uh, the, the, you know, the, the margins are low when they do, are making money. And it's like, uh, you know, to pick on someone, it's, you know, oh, look, it's a thermostat. Uh, we're competing against the, you know, the $19, $19 thermostat with a spring in it. So we got to make sure this is, and so it's got to be cheap. We're not going to, we're going to do the minimum thing possible. We're not going to invest a lot in, so, in the engineering process. And then you're not going to patch it. But we're going to Wi-Fi enable it so that you can control the temperature in your house remotely. Well, those uh, are are problematic. Mm -hmm. <laughs> they they uh, are are difficult to, or they're they're not too difficult to to pop and take over. Right. Uh, bad people are taking them over. Um, if you were getting regular updates, it's not as terrible because they would be fixed. But uh, they did not. That is something that is hopefully coming around there's uh, been some uh, executive orders around software quality that should help with some of that but fundamentally uh, th these are devices that come in uh, they come in from you know on the cheap they have you know password one two three four and you can get into a back door mm -hmm. to change the state of the thing but once you're in the device you can then start pounding on other devices behind your wi-fi router gateway and mm -hmm. then that makes it more complicated. You can you have more attack surface there. Uh, your router is smart. Your router doesn't let uh, a file sharing protocol that was used in WannaCry through from the outside. It just doesn't. There's no mm -hmm. reason for that. No one should ever do that. But you let that happen inside because you have you know two machines or you have a printer or some other things. Yeah, you know this is how you share data in inside your 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 corporate network or your home network. Mm -hmm. And as soon as you get popped by it, your IoT device gets popped, they can go around and start seeing if they can exploit some of these things that yeah. would otherwise be stopped from going around. So uh, coming down the road, hopefully uh, we will get ahead of the IoT problem before it becomes a huge issue. But uh, there have been plenty of cases. You can go search for IoT hack uh, mm -hmm. online and I, you will find lots of articles about devices that have had problems. And so. We have so we a little should, ways to go on that front. We should be checking to see if we have any of those devices that have been contentious. <laughs> yeah. Well, we will check for you from here. Oh, yeah. <laughs> what advice do you have for our audience, for anyone who is interested in learning more about how to protect themselves, about cybersecurity, about responsible use of tech? Um, so sure. protecting yourself, uh, you know, all major publishers, so Microsoft, Google, Apple, Amazon, they all have uh, generally pretty good access from their website on how to help secure the products that you get from them and general security things as well. Uh, CISA.gov CISA is the agency that is uh, trying to help all of us get better. And so they have lots of resources on their website. Um, and you have to, <laughs> yes, don't click the link, but uh, there's there there are lots of resources out there. Um, everybody has gotten better about privacy controls as well, and so you know, that the, the often gets lumped together. Uh, your your account security and your privacy, or for any given service, are usually lumped together. And so, mm -hmm. I mean, for whatever service you're talking about, go to your accounts and look for security settings. You can probably find some there. Um, it is worthwhile reviewing those on a regular basis. Uh, Venmo is having another round of bad press, for example, because the default setting for Venmo for a long time was to make your purchase or your transfer history open. Now, most people would say, why would you do that? But I don't I don't know why they chose that. And, and there is there are settings deep in there to turn that off. But even those are, they've moved and they've changed the semantics slightly. So you should, do it. Uh, Facebook is interesting in their own way, but at least they say every few months, "Hey, you should review your security settings and your privacy settings." So you should, you know, do that. Um, you should use uh, two-factor authentication when you can. So there are authenticator apps 
of various kinds. Uh, banks often support them. Uh, the thing where they text you back isn't ideal, but it's better than nothing. Mm -hmm. uh, and you often, like, uh, my, my bank will say, okay, you can log on from your desktop browser, but we're going to, we're going to talk to our app on your phone and right. you have to go through your app there. So it's a two factor method that also works well. So, uh, lots of resources out there. Uh, people are, are, well, companies are, are generally waking up to being better security partners and all this. And how can we support our technical fellows and our technical partners in helping to make the internet and the digital sphere a safer place? Uh, crazily, it, again, the, the more frequently you stay up to date or the, with greater reliability that you're up to date, the better that everything is for people. And then we can mm -hmm. focus on uh, the, the softer, the squishier threats like disinformation and impersonation and spear phishing and stuff like that. But mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I guess in a certain sense, you have to kind of think outside your box a little bit and realize that just because mail arrived or just because mm -hmm. uh, someone is in North Korea, they are just as close to you electronically as uh, the, the person next door. Right. Rich, is there anything else you'd like to share with us before we wrap? Oh, I mean, there's an infinite list of things we could probably <laughs> share, uh, but uh, maybe we hold off for tonight before people doze off. Well, I find that this has been very, very thrilling and interesting. <laughs> I'm always, I'm genuinely always fascinated by the entire cybersphere. So Great. I'm very grateful that you took time out of your schedule to perform this presentation for us and prepare this presentation rather to help us all. You know. <laughs> if only we'd prepare the cameras better. <laughs> we can't win them all every day. <laughs> That's all right. I think it worked out perfectly. But on behalf of the Mariah Mitchell, I'm eating my words, the Mariah Mitchell Association, I'd like to thank you again for taking time to share and present for our science speaker series on November 29th. I'd also like to thank Bank of America, our lead sponsor, as well as Cisco Brewers of Nantucket and the White Elephant Hotels and Resorts of Nantucket and Palm Beach for being generous sponsors, thank making you. our science speaker series free and accessible to all. 